Um, as the title says, this talk is about my journey to start a Rust driver project, and I want to start with just a few words regarding the structure of this talk. So first, I briefly want to introduce the project that motivated this journey, namely the Nova GPU driver, and talk about the motivation to start this project and about its current status. And throughout the talk, I'll do a few digressions to talk about my learning process in terms of Rust and the challenges I face bootstrapping this project in terms of upstreaming the required Rust abstractions. So let's start with what is Nova. So Nova is basically a DRM GPU driver for NVIDIA GPUs uh, that support the GPU system processor and short GSP. Uh, and we're using the Rust programming language. So GSP is basically just a firmware processor and it's built into NVIDIA GPUs for Turing and later chipsets and provides a firmware interface that abstracts the actual hardware. And in the long term, we intend Nova to serve as the successor um, of Nouveau for all GSP-based GPUs. So this basically throws up two questions. The first one being, why start a new driver project for NVIDIA GPUs at all? Why not just keep using Nouveau? And to answer this, I want to share a bit how I got involved into the Nouveau project and what my experience has been. So about two years ago, I started to work on DRM GPU VM, which is a generic DRM component to manage the GPU's virtual address spaces, and it keeps track of mappings and their backing buffers, and provides a couple more features to support drivers implementing VMBind UAPIs, which uh, basically allow user space to control the GPU's uh, virtual address space through asynchronous bind queues, and that's a feature that's required by the Vulkan Graphics API. So at the time, multiple drivers were in development that required such a component, such as XE, Panther, and PowerVR, uh, but also Nouveau needed it uh, to get the NVK user space Vulkan driver going, and that's what I was working on. So the first thing I recognized, and I found that rather counterintuitive, is that Nouveau only really had one key contributor, and I found it counterintuitive because NVIDIA hardware is, is extremely popular, and there's a lot of, lot of interest around it, so I thought one would expect more interested people to, um, to work on this project. So while I was working on GPU VM and Nouveau's uh, new UAPI, I discovered that it's extremely difficult uh, to get involved into the project for various reasons. So first of all, it's a reverse engineer driver uh, with almost no documentation on how the hardware actually works. And additionally, the hardware itself is, is rather complicated. And uh, another complication is that it supports a lot of different GPUs that partially are even over a decade old. And now we have yet another complication, which is to support multiple um, GSP uh, firmware versions uh, across the driver. And that's a lot of complexity, but at the same time, there is almost no documentation throughout the driver. And I think that's especially problematic for some parts of the driver. <coughs> so Nouveau is basically split into uh, two layers. The first one, the DRM layer. Um, so those are the parts that interface with the subsystem. And then we have the NVKM layer, which serves as a, kind of a hardware abstraction layer, and they are interconnected with an iOctal-like interface called NVIF. And the DRM layer does not suffer as much from missing documentation, I think, because for the DRM components, the semantics of the components is basically known, and we also have a lot of documentation for that. So you can still infer the semantics to understand how the Nouveau implementation around those components work. But for NVKM, uh, especially because we have no documentation for the hardware, uh, this layer is very complicated and it's also hugely abstracted in a C++ style manner and it's just everything else but obvious to understand in, in terms of locking and lifetimes and general architecture. And I really think that the missing documentation in combination with its complexity is a problem to scale the project and attract new contributors which we need to keep the project maintainable. Uh, so besides that, we also have a few technical issues. So one of them is uh, that with the introduction of VMBind UAPIs and user space controlling the virtual address space, um, this is managed in GPU VM, so in the DRM layer, but the page table management is actually implemented within NVKM um, with a local locking architecture. And this doesn't really work out very well because bind queues from the UAPI uh, are synchronized with DMA fences, so we need a global and especially an aligned locking architecture 
around this to avoid lockups. And so far, I managed to work around it as good as possible. But um, I'm sure there are still edge cases where at least theoretically lockups are still possible. So there's definitely a rework required. Um, but that's that's going to be difficult, and uh, because the page table management needs to be moved out of the NVKM layer, and it still has a lot of dependencies there, and that's uh, complicated, and it's also a lot of effort. Now, at the time when I finished that work, uh, it happened that Nouveau's longtime maintainer and key contributor stepped back, and I took over um, as one of the Nouveau maintainers, and I thought a lot about how to move forward with Nouveau and, and address the named issues. And especially considering the introduction of GSP, we basically came to the conclusion that we're just better off uh, starting a new GSP-only driver and just make a clean cut from the non-GSP legacy code. So the second question that I think comes up is, um, what are the reasons for choosing Rust? Um, and I think the first and obvious reason is how Rust helps with memory safety. Um, but I think this has been already discussed a lot of times, and it has been discussed probably way better than I could. So I just want to refer to some great talks from uh, Miguel, from Benno, from others, and I could name some more people there. Um, but I just linked in uh, three uh, talks from, from these three guys in the slides that I can, can really recommend. Uh, so another reason for using Rust is the GSP firmware. So GSP, uh, the GSP firmware is implemented with message and command queues in shared memory. And the GPU engines and devices are configured by data structures exchanged through those message queues. However, the firmware header files do not give any guarantees about structure and field names, field ordering within the structures, and semantics between firmware versions being stable, um, not even for the message queue mechanism itself. And the reason for that basically is how NVIDIA typically distributes their software. So when they need to um, make a change in the firmware, for instance, they, they just can change the firmware and, uh, if required, change the kernel driver or even user space driver accordingly. And because they just distribute everything together as a whole new version that does not claim to give um, any guarantees about uh, backwards and forwards compatibility. So for the upstream kernel, this is obviously different. So once we support a firmware version, we have to keep supporting it. Um, so we have to build some kind of abstraction. Uh, around the firmware interface. And while that's possible to do in C as well, uh, it, it, it really turns out messy and hard to maintain, uh, especially when we consider that not every version changes everything, and we, we still need to keep some common code that um, can, by the next version, just change unexpectedly at any point of time, and we need to branch something out. And um, if, we, if we would try to abstract it in pure C, we would probably end up in something with having C files with functions prefixed with uh, preprocessor macros uh, or definitions and then include them in other C files with the definitions for the corresponding version and then just build an abstraction with function pointers and make them point to the corresponding version on runtime. Um, I'm pretty sure um, there are other options, but they all kind of turn out a bit messy. So. Uh, it turns out that in Rust, uh, it, it's, it's actually way better to manage um, because of Rust has one feature called procedural macros, uh, which allows us to generate um, namespaces for the different versions in Rust. So um, what we do, um, and when I say we, I mostly mean Dave Early, um, who is working on that. Um, we generate Rust structures from the C headers um, in a separate namespace per version and then build abstraction structures within a generic namespace that implement those firmware interfaces. And the differences, we just annotate those um, in the implementation with um, version identifiers. And then we have a proc macro that takes care of generating the actual per version implementation out of this abstraction. And uh, on runtime, we can then just pick the corresponding version for the firmware we just loaded. And they're all going to have the same interface because that's defined by a common trait. So a trait in, in, in Rust is just uh, just an interface definition, basically. So um, after coming to the conclusion to, to use Rust, um, there was still one problem left for me, which is uh, I didn't know Rust yet. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how I learned Rust, and maybe even more important, um, provide some insights on how I felt during that process. So as the title of the talk already says, 
my personal background has been to be a kernel engineer for more than 10 years, and uh, so writing C code is what I usually do. Um, and I just started with reading through the book, The Rust Programming Language, which is kind of the Rust equivalent to um, the famous book, The C Programming Language, and I just start, started to learn about the basics, such as ownership and borrowing and slices, traits, lifetimes, pinning, and, and a bunch of more stuff. And well, at least uh, some of those concepts were new to me. Everything kind of made a lot of sense and, and looked quite straightforward, and I was, was really excited to learn something new. So after I started to feel at least a little bit comfortable, I started to look at existing Rust kernel code and abstractions to learn from. And knowing how the corresponding C code works, I basically started to reverse engineer what the Rust code does and how it works. And that's probably a very hard way to learn, um, but uh, it's what I like to do. And, and uh, it, it, it kind of worked out in the end for me, at least. Um, however, this was also where my excitement got a little bit tempered because since due to the complexity of those abstractions, they can be really challenging for beginners to understand. And um, like on the slide, you basically see an example of code that I ran into and, and uh, yeah, that, that, that was really tricky at the beginning. And I think this is especially because sometimes you may find complexity where it's not really expected to be found. And I'm going to give an example on that later on. Uh, so what makes that code complicated, you may ask, and I think uh, the reason is that we have to abstract unsafe, and I mean unsafe in the, sa in the sense of Rust, uh, C APIs into safe Rust APIs that um, offer certain memory safety guarantees. Um, or in other words, the code of the abstraction serves as a recipe to teach the compiler how to ensure memory safety around those existing C APIs. And obviously this creates some complexity because we need to encode semantics into the abstraction and depending on the design of the C APIs, sometimes also in rather creative ways, I would say. So my experience has been that this is important to be aware of because otherwise it's very easy to get confused and frustrated about why abstractions may turn out to be complicated, especially throughout the learning process. And at least in the beginning, abstractions are what we have to deal with before everything else to, to take advantage of Rust's capabilities. So um, unfortunately, we have to just start with the hard part. So as we all know, um, one can only really learn a programming language by writing code. So I started to work on, on the Nova stub driver and the required abstractions for a PCI DRM driver. And this was where the real fun began. And I must admit, in the beginning, it was really rather frustrating uh, because it, it really felt like that for every compiler error I fixed, I just created two new ones. And the reason for that was that naturally, I still thought about problems in the C way. Um, so I, I basically tried doing things that I knew were correct by convention, but I was ignoring that I have to design the code in a way that I teach the compiler how to validate things for me. And maybe that sounds obvious, especially if you have a Rust background, but for me personally, it was uh, really important to keep me aware of, and um, with keeping that in mind, things turned out to be going uh, pretty well. So um, in conclusion, learning Rust has been a rather smooth experience for me in general. However, I think that Rust can, because of its complexity, definitely be a challenge to learn, especially and, and given that C is a rather simple language compared to Rust when you have a rather exclusive C background. Um, but my personal experience has been that another factor might be even more important, so especially when when people are used to certain concepts, getting comfortable with new ones can be a bit challenging. And I personally had to make sure that I kind of constantly silenced the small devil on my shoulder that in the beginning tried to sneak in excuses on why things aren't really working out the way I want. Um, so again, this may be obvious, but for me it has been uh, very important to reflect on. So next up, I want to talk a bit about how we approach the Nova driver project, because it's not really as simple as just working out the driver for a while and then just send patch, patches upstream, uh, so for obvious reasons. And I, I just started with an analysis of the existing Rust infrastructure, and 
I found a solid foundation and, and quite some brilliant people to work with. And um, however, there were also still major abstractions missing to get a more complex driver, like a PCI DRM driver going. And I also found that there is some kind of a chicken and egg problem in upstreaming at least some of those because the drivers require abstractions to exist, but the abstractions require a user before they can be upstreamed. And especially if the driver is complicated, uh, it, it may be hard to, to find something to, to justify them. And this has already been difficult for some projects, for instance, the Asahi project. And that's why we decided to just start with a Nova stub driver that acts as a reference implementation and justification to get some of those needed abstractions upstream and demonstrate how they fit together um, and obviously also serve as a basis for further Nova development. So let's see what the Nova stub driver does consist of. Um, so there are some general Rust abstractions that we need to be in place, like the device driver abstractions um, for Nova specific PCI, uh, DefRes, and IO abstractions. And uh, a lot of those um, are based on preceding work from Wetson that I just picked up and, uh, and made use of. Um, then we need some DRM abstractions. I also picked up some basic ones from, from Lina, from the SI project. Um, so also DRM device, driver, um, DRM file, um, ioctal abstractions, um, the vtable stuff, and, and uh, DRM gem objects. Uh, and the third thing I was uh, starting to work on was the REST allocator stuff. Um, so, so far the kernel uses the Rust stdlibs box and vec types um, and their stable API. So those are memory allocation primitives in Rust. And uh, their stable API does only really support a single global allocator, which is um, currently backed by kmalloc, obviously. Um, but this also means that we can't use vmalloc or kvmalloc as allocator backends. And that's why I implemented a generic allocator uh, interface and, and uh, kernel-specific box and vec types, which take an allocator through a generic type argument uh, to support arbitrary ba allocator backends. And uh, mm -hmm. if nothing unexpected happens, uh, this stuff should, should be merged uh, for 6.13. So uh, next up, I want to talk a bit about um, how the upstreaming of the device driver abstractions went. And afterwards, also briefly share how the allocator abstractions, um, while in the context of writing those abstractions, um, I was also able to, to spot something to improve the C code. So let's start with the device driver PCI and IO abstractions, which I um, sent to the mailing list. And I had quite some discussions about those abstractions with Greg. And in the beginning, we had some misunderstandings on what the abstraction types represent. And Greg also raised some concerns about the, uh, about the complexity um, of at least some of those abstractions. And after some more discussion and a bit of back and forth, he basically proposed to implement the whole driver registration part in C. <laughs> Um, which uh, obviously didn't really align with our goals. So um, I met with Greg at Kangrejos, which is a Rust for Linux conference about two weeks ago in Copenhagen and held a talk about the device driver abstractions. Um, and there I talked about the motivation for those abstractions and prepared a sample PCI driver for QEMU's PCI test dev and just started with an implementation in C that eventually calls into Rust. Uh, as proposed by Greg, uh, Greg and uh, then switched from, from C to Rust and incrementally added abstractions to transform the unsafe driver code uh, into safe driver code. And throughout the discussion, uh, we were able to resolve things and we finally agreed to move forward with those abstractions, which I'm really, really happy about. And uh, while the summary makes it sound easy, the whole process really took months and required a lot of work and is, by the way, also still ongoing because we don't have them upstream yet. There, there is still, still work to do and still discussions to take. Uh, and I think one reason why this discussion was a little bit difficult in the beginning, um, as mentioned previously, sometimes abstractions can be a bit more complicated or require a bit more semantics than one would expect. I was and wrong and you're right. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> That's why I do it. Um, and, and I really think the device driver abstractions provide uh, a good example for that, which is the PCI device ID tables. And um, I want to, want to show a bit in the, uh, first how the C code uh, looks like and 
compare it to the Rust code, and then show what the abstraction looks like. Um, I don't really know if I can point to something here. Well, that yeah, seems to work. So anyway, uh, we have a we have some private driver data, um, which is represented by this sample info structure, which just holds a U32. And then in the PCI device ID table, we have two devices um, to register. The first one is the QEMO test dev, the other one is just a foo device. Um, and they both get some driver private data. And the first thing we have to take care of and see is that we add the Sentinel value here, because if we forget it, um, the subsystem or the bus is potentially reading beyond the bounds of, uh, uh, of this area. And uh, then in probe, we basically get the PCI device ID uh, pointer, and we can uh, just through the ID's driver data pointer resolve back to our private driver data. Um, and another thing we have to take care of here is type safety because we have to cast back to the correct type. So this is just a void pointer. Um, and we want to use that data. Uh, we also have to sure it's non-null because potentially I can also pass just the null pointer in or any other pointer. Um, so we have to take care that we handle that fact as well. So this is how the corresponding Rust code looks like, and I think it's pretty similar. Um, the Rust code abstracts the ID table and, and the stuff in a, in, in a macro, which is called define PCI ID table. And the first argument of the table uh, is really the type of the private data um, that we um, put into uh, the devices we register. Uh, so in this case, it's also uh, just an info structure, um, also contains a U32. And for the QEMO PCI test dev, uh, we just pass none uh, because we don't want it to have any private data. Uh, and the foo device just gets some data. And uh, note that we don't need to put a sentinel here because that's what the abstraction takes care of. So we cannot forget it. Uh, in probe, we uh, get then uh, already as function parameter, and we can change that. That's one of the things I think we discussed to change that we also pass in an abstraction for the ID table uh, instead of only the private data. But in this example, I just pass in the, the, the private data itself. Uh, and it's uh, a reference to uh, the self ID info type. And the self ID info type is an associated type that's associated to the structure, so the driver structure of the driver. And it, in the end, it's just a type alias for the thing that we stuffed in, into the macro. So it's basically equivalent to the info structure here. Uh, and it's also wrapped by an option because we, we also can pass in none. So that means we have, have no private data for, for this device. And when we want to access it, we actually have to deal with the fact that it's an option. We cannot just um, just uh, ignore that it's an option and potentially end up with a null pointer because that's enforced by the compiler. Uh, so this would this would uh, if we don't deal with that, it 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 would break on compile time and we would be uh, would be forced to fix it. Uh, and of course, also we have we have the type safety. It cannot be another type than the one that we stuffed into the macro. Um, so the abstraction, unfortunately, looks like this. So it's a lot of code. And that has been one of the things that, that we had a little bit of confusion of. So just to achieve those three things, we basically need a lot of abstraction. And just to clarify, this is an example um, that is more showing an exception rather than the rule. Um, and I really just picked this one to create some awareness of why sometimes abstractions can be a bit more complicated than one may expect. Um, but uh, also, we have to be aware of that just in the, in, in the abstraction. So no user is ever bothered with this code. So this is just written once, um, and, and a user of, of the device driver infrastructure will never get to see it. Uh, and as uh, promised um, previously, I also want to briefly share how the allocator abstraction uh, improved the existing C code. And I want to start with how the um, how to allocate memory in Rust at all. Uh, so uh, let's start with how the current API looks like. And the current API is based on Rust STD lib types uh, with a few extensions to uh, support um, the get free page flags and also make the allocations failable. Um, so the, in, in Rust we have, uh, and that's the most primitive structure to allocate memory with, we have this box type, um, which is, uh, Having, so in the end, it's just a smart pointer. It really only holds a unique pointer. 
and it has uh, one type generic, um, which is a type T, and the type T defines the size of the allocation. So the, the, the allocation size is really just the size of the type T. And if we um, just want to allocate for, for in, in this case, an i30, I'm using the wrong laptop. If we just want to allocate for an i32, um, we can call box with new and pass in the value we want to get this memory initialized with. Um, in this case, it's just four. Um, pass the page flags, and then we just get uh, the allocation. Uh, and as mentioned previously, currently, this is just implemented with uh, kmalloc as the backing allocator, so you have no chance to um, use some other allocator backend such as vmalloc or kvmalloc. And in the new API that I worked on, um, I, um, I used this allocator trait um, and redefined box, or actually re-implemented box and back in, for the kernel. Um, so the structure looks pretty much the same. It also has this T-type generic, but additionally it gets another type generic, A, um, which uh, must implement the allocator trait, so this allocator interface that defines how to allocate memory in the backend. Uh, and now when we want to use that, we can, we can just pass the type generic for, for instance, kmalloc, vmalloc, or kvmalloc, and then the corresponding allocator backend is used. And because that, that way of writing it is a bit convoluted, we can also just set a type alias for that. And uh, so for instance, kbox is just a type alias to a box with still a generic type T, um, but with the second generic type um, set to kmalloc. Uh, and this is something that Rust already supports, so it's not like that we need a re-implementation of that or any duplicate code, so this is really just a one-liner to create this type alias. So now let's look at how the allocator trait is defined. It's currently rather simple because um, that's all what we need for now. Maybe in the future we extend it, but for now that's, that's really all we need. And it has uh, three functions, alloc, realloc, and free. And uh, the only function that we really need to implement uh, is realloc uh, for any allocator that we want, want to implement because as realloc is defined, we can basically derive default implementations for alloc and free from it. So alloc is basically implemented as realloc um, with, with passing as an old pointer to the old allocation, just none. So it's just a new allocation and for free, uh, we just pass some allocation in, obviously, um, but, um, but set, set the size to zero, so we basically allocate to zero, which is uh, uh, reallocate to zero, which is effectively a free. Um, and this really works out, with, works out great with the existing API for, for kmalloc, because um, the kernel's kreallock function already implements uh, exactly this semantics. So the only thing we really need to do is to call kreallock from realloc for, for the kmalloc implementation, and, and that's it. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping code, of course, but uh, it, it, it's really that simple. Now, unfortunately, the kernel haven't had a v realloc, and the k realloc um, was implemented in a different way. So k realloc had a different function signature and different semantics. So k realloc was implemented in, instead as when the old size is greater than the new size, it always returns the old allocation. Um, even if the new size is set to zero, it doesn't free it, it just returns the old allocation. And if new size is greater than old size, kv realloc um, was just allocating new memory with kv malloc and just doing a hard copy and, and uh, freeing the old pointer and returning the new one. And to align that a bit, oh, that wasn't intentional. Uh, and to align that a bit, I um, implemented a v realloc that basically works exactly the same way as, as k realloc from a semantical point of view and then use kreallock and vreallock within kvreallock um, to just represent that, and now they have the same, uh, the, the exact same uh, different, uh, exact same function signature, and they expose the exact same semantics. And I really think that's an improvement for the C API because it's really unexpected if you have different realloc functions where one of them, if you allocate, uh, reallocate to zero, frees the memory, and the other one doesn't. So that's really error prone. So I think that's that's a good. Uh, good alignment here. Um, another advantage it has, but I haven't that implemented yet, is you could do optimizations in vrealloc now, um, which you couldn't do with the old um, implementation, uh, or actually you couldn't benefit from that in the old implementation of kvrealloc, 
because if your allocation shrinks, you could now just unmap pages and free them. And if your allocation grows in vRealloc, you could uh, just allocate additional pages and then just map them if you have enough space in the virtual address space left um, for, for this particular mapping. If you don't have enough space, you can at least unmap everything and, and remap to a different location and then you still avoid the hard copy. Um, so that's something that I plan to implement but haven't done yet. So for this rework, vRealloc is still just stupidly copying things. And out of this implementation, there are also... Um, came another issue. Um, so it revealed an issue where get free page is not properly honored for k-realloc. Um, so if you have uh, a k-realloc um, that allocates, let's say, 64 bytes, it ends up in the 64 byte k-malloc bucket. And if you then shrink the allocation to 48 bytes, still with get free page zero set, um, and then just reallocate back to 64 bytes so you grow it again, then the last 16 bytes would still contain like the magic value that we set after the original allocation, even though you set, you, 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 you set the get free page zero flag, which is uh, obviously a bug. And yeah, so the solution was just to handle get free page zero in the same way um, as we handled the case and red zone stuff. So when we shrink the buffer with case and red zoning, we have to um, poison the remaining um, memory in the bucket and here we just zero it, so it's the exact same solution. So lastly, I want to talk a bit about status and introduce the folks working on the project and also what they are working on. Uh, so there's Lud Paul, she's working on RVKMS, and RVKMS is basically just a Rust version of VKMS, uh, which is the virtual kernel mode setting uh, driver, um, so just the virtual display driver. And uh, she basically writes that driver as a reference implementation to develop the DRM KMS Rust abstractions for because we cannot just yet work them out in Nova because Nova is just not yet in a state where we can, can design those abstractions because we don't have all the firmware stuff working yet. Um, so we can't use the hardware to that extent yet. So Lute is also working on some Rust abstractions for IRQ management, so the IRQ enable, disable, uh, spin lock IRQ safe stuff. Um, then we have Dave. Dave's working on a Rust VFIO user space driver for NVIDIA GPUs, and we use that basically as a playground and, and PUC for initial and upcoming firmware abstractions um, and to, to figure out what's the exact best way to, to implement it. Uh, and he also wrote a Rust tool to parse the GSP header files and generate the corresponding uh, Rust structures out of it. Then we have Abdil on the team. He's working on, on Rust abstractions as well. He's working on, on some ELF header abstractions, scatter list stuff, and uh, I think a few more one that we also need to um, load firmware into the GPU, um, and that's also what he's, he's implementing now as well. And then we have Philip. Um, Philip's working on the DRM GPU scheduler. He just picked up um, the work there and starts with adding some documentation that the scheduler really needs, um, is looking into a couple of lifetime issues and really just prepares everything to start out with Rust abstractions for the scheduler as well. And uh, yeah, then there's me and I'm basically driving, coordinating the project and I think for all the other stuff we already went through that, so I'm not, not going to repeat that. And uh, that's, that's basically it. So. Any questions? First off, again, I was wrong. You were right. Um, but I also want to point out the craziness of those Rust bindings is due to the way the C <coughs> implements something very simple for C. And I think in talking with us, um, we are very open to making the Rust binding simpler by changing this part on the C side. And I think that's a good thing. So we can iterate and make things simpler because that, that is crazy. But you're doing it just because we're doing something dumb and C. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. So we it's, also all, it's all my fault that that's so com complex. <laughs> yeah. So and that's, that, that's something I didn't mention. So um, yeah, so, so when, I, when, I, when I first posted those abstractions, I didn't consider to change the C code to just make things simpler. Um, there are definitely options to do that, but I just kept the C API as it is, especially also because that's a very core API and I thought, okay, maybe that leads to a lot of changes into all kinds of buses and subsystems and 
Um, maybe it's better to just abstract. But if you can, if you can improve it, um, then then I'm yeah, we can iterate and make it simpler. Make the abstraction simpler. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Any questions? Um, is there a way we can capture sort of the in progress halfway points of developing these uh, abstractions? So, say a, a version of the abstractions that doesn't follow all the safety rules yet, or still has some issues, but that show these abstractions slowly being put into place. Um, you know, do we have these half finished things on the mailing list, or as you know? Version one's not that good. Commit another thing. Version two, or are these just you know sitting in people's heads? Yeah. So um, on the RESTful Linux homepage, um, there are um, there's a section about topic branches, and I keep maintaining some topic branches for quite a while. I, I think Miguel also showed them in 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 his talk about the Rust status update. Um, and there are branches for um, the device abstractions, for the PCI abstractions, and I also keep maintaining. Um, a branch that basically merges them all in and, and provides like a baseline that people can use to already start some Rust driver work. And there are also people um, who actually already use that. So I think there is some uh, CPU frag or CPU idle driver on the mailing list that uses uh, this stuff. And there are also, I think, some other drivers, like the NVMe driver from Andreas uses it. Um, so yeah, this is, this is around. So are we able to sort of keep like unfinished versions of these around, you know, longer term as documentation of, you know, this is not actually a usable or, you know, certainly an unsafe uh, version of the abstraction here, but you can use this to see here's what, you know, the initial C version does. Here's a few stepping stones in between that and something that has, you know, captured all of the, uh, the details around what you mean C is doing. Yeah, you, you mean as showing the progress of how things yeah. uh, were developed? I see. Um, yeah, those things should be on a mailing list. Um, so those things should be, should be able to be found as just versions of patch series on the mailing list. Awesome. Yeah, I'll note that um, at the risk of making it sound like we're asking you to do extra work, one of the things that might be really, really nice is if someone could write up that history, maybe with pointers to the lore links of the older versions, or maybe with the excerpts uh, of that code uh, as a possible LWN article, mm -hmm. just as like tutorials uh, for developers who are trying to understand what was happening. Uh, and I'll second what Greg um, actually said. Um, one of the things that happened uh, at LSFMM was that uh, there was an attempt to make the Rust abstraction super, super complicated so we didn't have to change a single line of C code. And after 20, 25 minutes, no one could understand the Rust um, binding and like people's heads were exploding. Uh, and I suspect that if we had taken the approach of let's just change the C code to make it be a little bit more Rust friendly as well as being friendly for the C users, uh, it probably would have been a much simpler um, Rust binding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think most of us very much subscribe to the uh, simple is good, keep it simple uh, sort of uh, philosophy. So yeah, I definitely think uh, I would second Greg's, uh, you know, sometimes the right answer is change the C code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... For the first thing you mentioned, so what you're asking yeah. is basically just have an article that basically uh, describes or reiterates the talk that I also prepared for King Rechos, where I basically went through the abstraction step by step, showing how they build from, I just convert the C code to Rust stupidly in a way that we wouldn't never write Rust code, and then just add abstractions on top and explain why and what are the steps. Yeah, I think that would be lovely, or maybe we can yeah. publish a link to the video of your talk, and then we could look I'm, at the video. Well, it wasn't but, the recording, unfortunately. Oh, well, yeah. You have an online version of the presentation that's actually really good. Ah, yeah. okay, yeah. So if there's an online present version of that presentation, it's just, I think for people to see that, that talk sounds like really, really great, and, and maybe we need to just make that more widely available. So Yeah. Uh, other questions or comments? I don't want to dominate the mic. <laughs> 
Uh, after switching to Rust, uh, what uh, uh, do you like more, C or Rust? Would you write more in C <laughs> or, mean what or I like Rust? More. Um, well, it's hard to say. They both have, have things I enjoy to do, so I still enjoy writing C code, if that's a question. Um, but I enjoy both languages for different reasons. So, like, I, I think C just has something that, that is fun. The, like the, the, and, and I think it's something that, that a lot of people also like. It's like <coughs> the freedom to do things that aren't really what people usually would want you to do, right? You can do, <laughs> you know, you can all the stuff that people consider to be bad, and sometimes that's actually fun. And it's just like, it's, it's a hacky language, right? It, that's, that's just a lot of fun to do. But, but I also enjoy Rust because I can fix a lot of those things that I cannot ensure with C, obviously. Thanks. Questions? So I don't know pretty much anything about Rust and even less about Rust in the kernel, but let's say during my C work on device drivers, I want to change an internal kernel API in C, which has Rust bindings. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? Do I have to learn all the Rust stuff to maintain or to change also that one? Yeah, I mean, ideally, um, when we upstream code, someone's going to maintain, someone's going to maintain it. And either it's the maintainer of the subsystem itself, um, and ideally the maintainer taking the code also knows how it works. Um, but if the maintainer is not comfortable dealing with that, I think it's also fair to ask the person upstreaming that stuff to take responsibility um, to also maintain those abstractions. And then I think the person can just be around to help out with that. Um, and, and I think for, for this case, I would just rely on that we have a community that helps each other. And um, I think in the end, that's, that's what, what at least I would do for the stuff that I have streamed. If someone comes and says, okay, I have to change the API and you're using that function, um, I will definitely be around and help. And I think um, I would be surprised if, if other persons doing that wouldn't be so nice and wouldn't help. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to echo that as someone who is maintaining the KUnit subsystem, which does have Rust bindings, um, you know, all of the people from the Rust for Linux project have been uh, very helpful where something is changing and I don't fully understand it. You know, um, the, the more this happens, the more I learn. It's great. Um, the question I'd have, which is uh, not quite as related, um, and I'm not sure we've got an answer yet, is writing bindings is clearly like one of the hardest things to do because you're matching two very separate worlds. Yeah. You have to encode all of this stuff. Where going forward would we want new people in the kernel who are learning Rust to start, as starting with bindings seems to be a very fraught experience. Um, do we need to find a place where, once there's enough rust in the, the kernel, we can point people to say, look, play in this area first, come back to the bindings um, once, once you've actually dealt with, with rust in a more natural environment? Well, I think once we have enough infrastructure in place that you can write drivers or most, most parts of a driver, that's definitely a good starting point to start with because then you're going to write Rust code that ideally, if we did the abstractions right, does not require unsafe code and it's really just kind of idiomatic Rust in the end and you can learn from that. And once you get to the point where you need some additional um, exotic ab abstraction for something that's not so widely used that it doesn't yet exist, and hopefully you have enough experience um, working on, on that. Um, but probably it's also helpful to really do what, uh, what was just recently proposed, that um, people like me who just go through this journey, just add resources and add things um, that, that help other people to do the same thing. Um, I also think that the RESTful Linux project um, recently um, started uh, some initiative to, to gather resources uh, together that help people with learning Rust. I haven't followed that too much, so maybe 
Uh, if Miguel's around, maybe he, he wants to say something about that. That's a So, uh, yeah, we have been trying to get uh, more people, uh, uh, more Rust experts uh, to help uh, the kernel uh, developers and to engage uh, the people that we have in the Rust subsystem right now in the list. Uh, some of them are really, really uh, Rust experts that, you know, contribute to the language, to the compiler, etc. Uh, they can really help uh, you guys. Uh, if you are one of the early maintainers uh, starting with Rust, I would take the chance if you are interested in Rust to, now is the time to, because they are there, they will be there. But the more people start to want to learn Rust, you know, we cannot scale it for every single person out there. There is like hundreds and hundreds of maintainers in the kernel. So it's a really nice time to say, hey, I, I want to uh, learn from you guys. Uh, so I am trying to grow the team to get even more Rust people uh, in that list so that we can have even more people to, to help you uh, starting. And by the way, uh, I will also put the, uh, in the Cangrejos, it's not in the website yet, but in the Cangrejos in, Tomorrow or, or tonight, I will try to have the, the slides of your other talks that people can check. So we're right about at time for break, but if there's one last question, any questions or comments? Yeah, I want to make some last com comments about the uh, que the that question at uh, what the best place if you want to play some Rust. So it's actually, I think with Danilo's introduction of our own allocator, we actually could use some help to implement some uh, iterators uh, abstraction for the allocator. There will be pure Rust and it will be some usage and uh, you know we can take a look and it's, it's not uh, related to any bending so you can, it's, it's, it should be the place to start. And we actually need that because we switch to our implementation of allocator, so we lose some power, uh, lose some ability using uh, standard libraries allocator. So, yeah. So thank you very much.